Video game history has tons of highs and tons of lows. And although most of the time we're trying to look at the bright side of life, sometimes to appreciate the good, you have to really take in the bad. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 of the worst moments in video game history. Starting off at number 10, the scalping, also known as the next-gen console's massive launch shortages. So the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox series launched in 2020, and we all know what was going on then. It was a little pandemic or something like that, and the global supply chain pretty much got messed up. About a year later, a lot of us were kind of thinking, yeah, you know, it's about to get better, right? And then it started coming out that like major electronics component suppliers told Bloomberg, yeah, no, we're not going to catch up anytime soon. It's uh, it's going to be tight till September 2022. And a lot of their customers, meaning, you know, console makers, weren't even going to be served until 2023. So that told everybody, yeah, this is going to be a long-term problem. And all the while, scalpers were laughing all the way to the bank. Like there was a pandemic going on with a disease but there was an epidemic going on with scalpers. They just swooped in and bought up all the consoles and left a lot of gamers not playing PS5 and Xbox series, but instead empty-handed sopping in the corner. Like you can understand why consoles sell out quick, but these folks would set up these bots to buy up every single console they could as fast as possible. And they didn't even want the damn things for themselves, just hoarding it like a dragon with gold, waiting for some kind of a sacrifice or something from us. I mean, higher end customers were willing to pay like 1500 bucks, even more sometimes for a PS5. Most of us were just turned into console star maniacs waiting in suspended animation for the time when they finally have these damn things again. It got better. I was at the store the other day. I saw like a ton of PS5s just on the shelf and I got like whatever the opposite of nostalgia is. And at number nine, the terrible 2013 Xbox One reveal, which was kind of supposed to be this big triumph with Microsoft winning this generation of the console wars before they even began. Um, instead it kind of was a disaster. Like with even the lead up to it being kind of a parade of negative press for Microsoft, it was their chance to show a lot of it wasn't true or at least kind of massage it to justify the extreme measures of like forced connectivity, stuff that was rumored and you know, kind of turned out to be true. Probably the thing that pissed off people the most was if you were going to buy a game on a disc, you weren't able to like take it into GameStop and sell it, which was obviously much bigger then than it is now. But that thing was basically bound to you, which was unheard of. So the company failed spectacularly with this thing. Like most of the key announcements just fell flat. Like the TV integration was all right if you're in the United States, but most people aren't. Mandatory Connect was also like disturbing. Like the cameras listening out for you even when it's quote unquote off, which it never actually was. And Microsoft tried to say, ah, oh, there's strong privacy protections. But you know, it was an always on camera inside your living room. I just remember all the HAL from 2001 Space Odyssey comparisons alongside the Big Brother 1984 comparison. Like there was not a lot of positivity towards that. There was also the loss of backwards connectivity, which that stung a lot. So instead of winning the console wars before they began, Microsoft found itself on the back foot. They came out early and laid down all their core features and they were just widely unpopular, not just with like vocal video game forum regulars, but people who typically were evangelists for Microsoft. It was such a disaster for Microsoft that they actually considered abandoning the Xbox brand. And that came right out of Phil Spencer's mouth. Like that's bad. And number eight is the death of the Adobe Flash player. Like, I know not everybody here is my age and remembers the golden age of Flash games where there's tons of free interactive content you could just access all the time because Adobe Flash Player was something that anybody could make a game in. And man, oh man, are there some good ones. I mean, not just games, there was cartoons and stuff like Homestar Runner. That's pretty much inaccessible for quite a while. But worse, a lot of games are just gone. 
It killed access to thousands of Flash games online, and so many of them were never remade in another platform because, frankly, that's the way that these people knew how to make games. We had dynamic HTML and HTML5 kind of take over the space that Adobe Flash existed in, and I'm not going to defend Adobe as a company, but Apple was probably who really led the charge to destroying this. They criticized the closed nature of the Flash platform and claimed that dynamic HTML and HTML5 were the future, they were open and way better, and you know, funny thing about that, there is absolutely nothing like that now. Like, when all of these independent, random people could just make games and upload them, and it was like a thing, it was a movement in its own way, while the protocol might not have been open, that sure seemed way more open than whatever the hell we have now. Like, fortunately, there are Flash emulators out there, and the Internet Archive has worked to preserve this stuff, but still, there was a time where this was the internet. Like, there was this crazy movement of odd, strange things. Fun games like Q-Op and Hot Wheels and a lot of other just, like, really interesting original stuff, and it's just kind of dead now. I don't really think a substitute's happened. At number seven, let's talk about the 2014 cyber attacks at Christmas. Ah, Christmas morning, the sound of wrapping paper rustling, children laughing, and millions of gamers cursing loudly at their television screens after plugging in their new game consoles. You see all these gamers curled up on the couch ready to sink their teeth into the new game they were waiting for, particularly the multiplayer ones. But let's say somebody wanted to use the PSN or Xbox Live game store and download something, or there's a day one patch, or whatever. There's a lot of stuff that involves the internet and video games the last couple of generations uh, for millions of gamers in 2014 you just got an error message and couldn't do anything so a group called lizard squad which i mean is a funny name i gotta at least give them that didn't like them a whole lot though because it was a ddos distributed denial of service attack they launched on christmas eve on xbox live and psn just rendering the services completely unusable and went on for a, a second day too like gamers across the globe got bricks for Christmas, at least, again, for a couple of days. What's interesting is there was a rival hacking group called the Finest Squad, who didn't have as good of a name. I I'm not going to lie. Lizard Squad, much better name. The Finest couldn't beat the Lizards, and the Lizards claimed responsibility for this huge, annoying attack that took several days to fully recover from. And although it seems like a distant memory, honestly, I think I still feel as mad about it now. Like, whatever problems hackers have with these large companies, I'm like, to agree with so why are you punishing me the person who wants to play a game at number six the video game industry's thankfully brief love affair with nfts ah nfts non-fungible tokens tokens that you cannot funge it really seemed like the gaming industry was going to fall into an even deeper pit of mini payments and microtransactions, but thankfully this did fail pretty spectacularly. Perhaps even as spectacularly as the Xbox One reveal. Um, so NFTs are about as popular as an annoying dude wearing socks with sandals making a pineapple pizza and forcing you to eat it. Yeah, people have different tastes and all that, but man, people get mad as hell when you say any of that crap. Same goes for NFTs. Like, we're talking about an industry where microtransactions, DLC, expansions... I mean, I'm not going to say that every single example of those things is bad, but over-monetization is something that we've complained about for well over a decade. So Square Enix and Ubisoft, among others, decided, hey, how can we figure out how to make that worse? Oh, I know, by making supposedly unique items that you could, in theory, have anywhere in any digital world because you own it. Literally zero of those things worked out because in order to have an item that you bought in one game and another game, there has to be an asset for it in the other game. So the idea of them simply being unique, that's a big no. Then you would have to have different publishers agree with each other that purchases from one game would carry over to it's really stupid actually anybody who's familiar with business not just from the perspective of a consumer but also from an implementation perspective it's dumb but all these executives saw dollar signs tried it out and got stomped on by everyone else thankfully i mean it could have gone way worse they could have succeeded and uh they didn't for a minute it really looked like they were gonna force all this crap on us though 
And number five, the great Nintendo delisting. So back in March, a ton of Nintendo gamers were frantically clicking the buy button, sweating profusely, desperate to buy Nintendo classics before they're gone forever, because Nintendo shut down the Wii U and 3DS eShops. So yeah, around 2,000 digital-only games went dark on March 27th. You had a Wii U and wanted to play any of their digital-only games? No. Dumbs is gone. Same goes for 3DS. If you had any inkling to purchase a, a game using the eShop on either of those platforms, yeah, that's a no. No more. It's done. That also meant Virtual Console was just gone. So now the only retro games you can play on a Nintendo platform are through Switch Online. And that's cool and all, but that distribution model is completely different than the Virtual Console. And a ton of games that were only available through there are just gone as well. This is going to be an ongoing problem too because a lot of these titles may not appear somewhere. I, I, I think that this sucked so badly just given there's no alternative for so much of this content through Switch. Like, are they going to preserve this video game history? We'll see. And at number four, now we're really getting into some of the worst ones. Horse armor, the canary in the coal mine. Now, there's kind of a misconception with people when they look back that this is kind of like a harbinger, the first microtransaction, but it actually wasn't. It was certainly the biggest and most noticeable. In 2006, Bethesda offered Oblivion players a cosmetic upgrade for their in-game horses, armor for just $2.50. Now, this sparked a ton of outrage. They saw it as a blatant attempt to profit off of what was literally nothing. Now at the time, the word microtransaction wasn't really widely adopted and most gamers referred to it as bad DLC. Despite the fact it pissed what seemed like everybody off, it was actually a pretty big success in sales and proved the business model of profiting off of small cosmetic purchases in big budget games that already cost 60 bucks. This is pretty much single-handedly credited for the widespread adoption of microtransactions, particularly the dumb ones. And its legacy lives on in the predatory monetization tactics used by game publishers today, which we love to refer to as horseshit. At number three, the 1993 United States Senate hearing on violent video games. So in 1993, the United States Committees on Governmental Affairs and the Judiciary held congressional hearings with spokespeople from companies like Nintendo, Sega, Acclaim, Activision, etc. Because of a moral panic over the perceived impacts of violence in video games. <laughs> People like Joseph Lieberman, Herb Cole, Hillary Clinton were all highly critical of the quote-unquote realistic depiction of violence in video games. Keeping in mind, this was in 1993. If you look back at Mortal Kombat, the crap that caused this, to call that realistic, oh my god. Now, I think this whole thing's stupid. Research has shown there is no causal link between violent video games and real world violence. And there's been a lot of research done, not just by people defending video games, but by people attacking video games. No one's found crap. That said, I don't entirely hate the result, having a rating system for video games, even though, yes, the SRB is certainly flawed. But no more will children be corrupted by such games as Night Trap. Which, holy crap, did anybody even want to play Night Trap? An FMV game on the Sega CD? I mean, it's, it's good that children can't just walk into a store and buy something that's not made for them, but man, I don't remember this fondly. And number two is the 2011 PSN hack. Way back in the spring of 2011, millions of gamers around the world found themselves cut off from their favorite online service. Certainly it's just down though, one might think, right? Uh, so all this happened because of an external intrusion on PlayStation Network and Curiosity, which we're not even gonna get into what that is. But personal details from about 77 million accounts were compromised. So on the first day of the outage, Sony said it might take up to two days for us to restore the services. And then they confessed the next day that they'd been hacked. They were pretty quiet, so people started speculating. And a few days later, Sony finally decided to say, hey, 
personal details of millions of people's uh, stuff. It's uh, it's out there. So usernames, email addresses, birth dates, home addresses, PSN passwords, purchase histories, security questions. And also, Sony didn't rule out the possibility that credit card data had been stolen. It was a wake-up call for gamers and companies alike, reminding everybody that it's super important to have good online security, and it took 23 days to get everything going again. It did not inspire confidence or trust in Sony, a dark brand that they dealt with for quite a while. And finally, uh, the video game crash of 1983. Essentially just a large scale recession in the video game industry where the market was saturated with crappy games and a ton of consoles that consumers really didn't understand or know anything about because they were all so similar yet so different. You couldn't play games on different consoles and the games kind of sucked anyways. Literally, the industry had a drop in revenue of 97%. Essentially, it was a video game bubble that popped because everyone and their mother was putting out crap consoles and crap games, and it pretty much squeezed out or made it difficult to find anything that was good, so people were just like, nah, the hell with video games. And then the NES happened. It was fantastic, it acknowledged all of the problems. Nintendo implemented the Nintendo licensing system, the Nintendo seal of quality, which actually miraculously somehow worked and games were all of at least a baseline standard and people loved it. It was a terrible thing that like, when you see 97% of the revenues in an industry disappear, you usually expect that industry to be over. And thankfully it wasn't because I mean, video games are what they are today. Awesome despite all their flaws. There are a lot of flaws. But as I said at the very beginning, you have to see the bad to really appreciate the good. That's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.